Thank you, Justin. And good morning, everyone, wherever you are. In full disclosure, I need to tell you that we went hog wild, got the most technologically advanced equipment we can get. So what that means is not only do you see me, but um, I see you there, you wearing your pajamas, you without makeup, you sitting there in front of the waffles, you asleep on the couch. I see all of you um, through the amazing, no, you didn't think you'd believe me, but uh, at any rate, we are glad you can see us. We're thankful that you're able to be here with us in spirit if you're not able to be here with us in person. So as our custom is, we want to begin our time today with the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to ask you all over the city, wherever you are, to take just a moment. Let's let our voices rise to heaven as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we are so grateful that you are sovereign God. You are in control. Now, the idea of you being in control doesn't mean that you orchestrate everything that happens because there are a great many evil things that happen. You're not the author of death and sin and pain and suffering, but you are the master of it. You master it, Lord. And what that means is that you never look down on a world that you have lost control over. It means that nothing in our lives touches us that you didn't either send and approve of or at least allow. Now, we don't understand the majesty of that verse in Psalms 119 that says God is good and everything that he does is good because sometimes it doesn't look like that. But we want to take a moment as we begin our time in the word today, we want to say thank you that all things really do work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. What we want to begin by saying today, Lord, is that we trust you. We trust you. And uh, the prophet said very wisely, if there's no um, apparent blessing, if the, the fig tree doesn't blossom and if there's not corn in the barn, we understand that God is still faithful to his people and still working for us. And we just want to say we trust you and we thank you in Jesus' name. I also want to pray for everyone that may be um, feeling ill. I want to pray for everyone that is worried about their job. I want to pray for everyone whose business is a big question mark to them right now instead of an exclamation point. A lot of us just don't know where things are headed. But we thank you that the eternal God is our refuge and underneath us are the everlasting arms. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the promise that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We can say of the Lord, he is our refuge, our fortress, our God. In him we trust. So, Lord, let's just lay all the cards out on the table today. We trust you. We know that you are our source and our strength not the government, not medical science, nothing else. They, they are tools you can use, but you are our refuge. So help us as we look into the word today to, to have our faith built and our hope sharpened. And may we go from this little time of gathering today far better than we thought imaginable. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Now I want to give you... Um, some preliminary thoughts before we get into the outline proper about uh, the topic that, that uh, we have chosen to share. Um, the, the name of it is uh, 
um, exposing Satan's methods. I think that's a good thing for us to latch on to today. Let me just give you some things that might answer some questions that are in your mind. Um, number one, as we work our way through this, as I've just intimated in the prayer, God is in control. He is in control not only here in this sanctuary, he is in control in your home, your apartment, your little groups that have gathered together. Um, he is good and all his dealings with us are good. He is not the author of sickness. As I said, he is the master of it. And Mike Bickle uh, had a great perspective on this idea of um, suffering and the coronavirus in general. He said that uh, in all of his years of walking with the Lord, he's come to believe that probably less than 5% of what God is doing at our lives at any given moment is seen by us. There are times God seems silent. There are times God seems really active. But the amazing thing, he says, we never are aware of more than just a fragment of it. That's how much God loves us. And that's how active he is working in our lives. Now, I want to say something else that's going to sound a little counterintuitive, and it may sound contrary to what you've been hearing from a lot of people. We do not want to give in to fear, certainly, absolutely. God's not given us a spirit of fear. But it's moments like this that God is sharpening and refining and teaching us so we don't want to give in to fear, but loved ones, please be careful. We don't want to, in the name of faith, we don't want to give in to arrogance either. I want you to know we need God right now. We need more than just a positive attitude. We need positive attitudes. We need to claim scripture. We, we need to rebuke fear. But we also need to understand that the fear of the right things, the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom. I, I think uh, it was summed up well by a physician in an Italian hospital that I saw on the news yesterday. He said uh, uh, how fatigued they were and how tired they were um, at that out of control virus in Italy. And he said, for the first time in my life, I'm realizing that with all we're able to do, we are not enough. And loved ones, it's good for the people of God to realize that while we should not live in fear, we also need to call on God. We need to realize that there are people around us who need to call on God. And I encourage you to have faith, not give in to fear, but also be very humble. And don't cave in to arrogance. It is entirely possible. God, we know from Scripture... God always works in us in situations like this. This is what James tells us. God always works in situations like this to refine us, to polish us, to purify us, and to change us. But if we're not careful, it will be entirely possible for some of us to come through this world-changing event on one hand totally unscathed, but on the other hand, totally unchanged. So let's don't let that happen. Now, where I want to go this morning is not a lesson about fear. I want to go into our regular order of sermons that we had laid out before this thing happened. Martin Lloyd-Jones said something that really stuck with me. Uh, Pastor Corey reminded me of it this week. Lloyd-Jones said, when the people of God are discouraged... They don't need encouragement as much as they need doctrine. Now, now, please don't misunderstand me. Don't give up on me and go uh, change out of your pajamas. Please bear, bear with me for just a minute here. Martin Lloyd-Jones was not saying that when we're down or confused or in despair, it would be wrong for us to seek encouragement. But he was saying this, it's not encouragement that will bring us out of discouragement. It's doctrine. It's the word of God. We, we need to understand that it's not just a positive mindset that we need. We need to get hold of truth. We need to really get hold of truth. And uh, let me remind you three or four things uh, before we get into God's word today. Um, Pastor Justin has basically covered it, but he says, 
Uh, he, and I agree with what he said. We're doing our best to stay in contact and to encourage you during this crisis. We realize that there is, there is nothing like the people of God coming together. You know, for 25 and a half years, I've been coming to this property and reveling in being with the people of God. And this is a tough thing today. This is a tough thing. We don't know how long this will last, and we don't know how many people are watching or not watching. But this is a tough thing. I love you so much, and, and I, I want to hold and hug every one of you. But please know that we're doing the best we can to keep in contact with you. I want to also ask you to please give during this crisis, uh, just in order to keep everything operating here. And as Pastor Justin has said, live streaming of Sunday morning services will continue until we're cleared to gather as usual. But I also want you to know if this continues longer than anticipated, we will also try to get Wednesday night uh, to you and also youth services. We just don't know what we're dealing with yet, but we will, and we will give the best response possible. Now to the message today in the time I've got left, um, exposing Satan's methods. This title, Exposing Satan's Methods, is based on a passage in 2 Corinthians 2. Now, Paul is talking about church discipline that they've had to enact, and he hasn't been there to, to, to work it out, and they're following his instructions, but now, they're, now they've followed instructions so long and so far. Paul said, you may have gone too far with this. Let's regroup. And it's kind of an awkward read going from Greek to English. But listen to what he says. Uh, he's talking about a person that has been disciplined and is forgiven. He said, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Real wordy in English, but what he's saying is we've got to work together on this so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. What he was saying is every time we have to deal with church business, especially unusual church business, it opens the door for the enemy to sow discord among us. And this is what he said. We don't want an advantage to be taken of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. He says, we know the way the devil works. The King James says, we're not ignorant of his devices. Um, but what we're really talking about is his methods. And you say, well, I don't know the devil's methods. Well, we see the way he works. We've had explanation Jesus said he's the father of lies and every lie comes from him. That's his method. We know that Jesus said that his purpose is to, to kill and steal and destroy. Those are his schemes or his methods. But maybe the best thing we can do is go back to the appearance of Satan in Scripture, Genesis 3, and let's see him the first time he shows his hand. And we're going to find out from this story that there are four things that he always tries to accomplish in moments of difficulty and in every one of our lives. The reading is in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 13. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. The serpent, coming to Eve in the garden, said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God 
as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I did eat. Now, that is the first place we see Satan's hand being shown. Let me give you some things to think about before we talk about Satan's deceit and ultimately his defeat. Um, you've got to remember John chapter 8 verse 44 says Satan is a liar and he's the father of all lies. Now that's a powerful phrase where it says he's the father of all lies. You compare it to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 where Paul said, blessed be God, our father, um, father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the father of all mercies. When he calls God the father of all mercies, or some translations, the father of all compassions, what God is saying is, if you want to understand mercy, if you want to understand compassion, you look at God Almighty because he is the father of all mercies. If you want to understand the definition of mercies, look at God. He's the poster child for mercy. It's the same kind of phraseology that's used of Satan um, when Jesus said that um, he's the father of lies. Jesus was saying Satan is the poster child for lies. Every lie is crafted from the heart of Satan. I used to tell my children when they were growing up, we're never more like the devil than when we lie. Always tell me the truth. Always tell me what's going on. Because we're never more like that evil entity than when we lie. Because he is the father of the lies. He, he crafts them. That's why as we move into the last days, the, the primary mark of the last days will be deception. Deception. Um, that's why the writer in the New Testament described Jesus in glowing, glowing terms by saying he was full of grace and full of truth. He was, he was the God that not only gives us a way out of our sin, but he's not going to sugarcoat our sin. And he's going to flood our lives with the light of the truth. Now, two things we want to observe very quickly today. Um, one is Satan's deceit, the deceitful nature of Satan. But we also, we don't want to stop there. We want to talk about his defeat. Uh, Adrian Rogers used to preach uh, on this passage of Scripture. I love what he said. He said, mankind today hates the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation more than any two books of the Bible. And we're going to read from both of them. We've already read from Genesis and he says, this is what the world says. Genesis is myth, not really true. It's just stories. And Revelation is mystery, meaning we can't understand it. So the devil wants us to stay away from Genesis and Revelation. The reason why is because in Genesis his doom is pronounced and in Revelation his doom is carried out. He hates these two books. So in his honor, we're going to read from both of them today. Now let me tell you very quickly four things that mark the deceit of Satan. Um, I'll, I'll give them to you quickly and then we'll work through them in just a little more detail. Um, number one, he wants to defile our concept of God. Satan found out a long time ago that it doesn't work to try to convince us that God doesn't exist. Oh, there are a few people that don't believe in God, but the scripture says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Uh, so he knows that he can't get us to really let go of the existence of God. Even if we don't like the God of the Bible, we'll put another God in his place. 
So he wants to defile our concept of God. The second thing he wants to do is develop doubt concerning God's word. Um, the third thing is to um, uh, distort the motives of God. Well, if there is a God and if his word is true, it's because God has evil intentions toward us. He doesn't want to share any of the good news. And we're going to talk about um, uh, this idea of doubting the word of God and how it distorts God's presence and how it distorts his motives. And the final thing is he wants us to distort God's justice. Um, I hear this all the time from people who are not believers. If God was real, why does he allow this? If God was real, why doesn't he do that? And we have um, uh, fallen prey to a wisdom. I heard an actor say the other day, even if God is real, I wouldn't serve him because of all the sickness he put on mankind. Well, he doesn't know his Bible very well. It's not that God put sickness on mankind. It's that our rebellion brought sickness on mankind. Let's look at these things real quickly. Um, number one, the devil wants to defile your concept of God. Going back to Genesis 3. Genesis 2 is incredible provision. You, you, have, a, um, <laughs> you have a garden called Eden that is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square miles, uh, possibly thousands if, if we've got our dimensions right. And it's loaded with provision. It's loaded with trees. And right in the middle of it, there's this one tree, just one, just one. And he says, you can go far and wide. You can go north, south, east, and west. Eat from any tree you want. Just stay away from this one. Have you ever had your child do that to you? You give him six pieces of candy. One is for somebody else, and that's the one he wants. Somebody asked Abraham Lincoln one time. He was, he was walking down the street with two of his sons. Both of them were crying. They both wanted uh, a walnut that was in Abe's hand. And somebody said to the president, what's wrong with your boys? He said, the same thing that's wrong with the whole world. I've got two boys, three walnuts, and both of them want two. Well, that's what we find to be the territory the enemy works on. He wants to defile our concept of God. 1 Timothy 6.17 tells us that God gives us everything to enjoy richly, but there are safety nets around his blessings. And what God wants us to know is that he gives us abundantly out of his riches in glory, but every once in a while he'll say no, he'll say thou shalt not. And what he wants us to understand is that every thou shalt not is really an I love you. There is an abandonment of the fear of God in Western civilization and Loved ones, I want you to know it's found roots in the church of Jesus Christ as well. Because if he can't distort, I mean, he'll, he'll keep working on this. If he can't get you to believe there is no God, he'll get you to the point that you receive an, a, a distorted concept of God. And if that doesn't work, he'll have you believe God is good and God is kind and God is merciful. But he will distort your confidence in God's love for you. In other words, you'll say, yeah, God is good, but he's good to better people. He's good to the preacher. He's good to the elder. He might even be good to my wife or good to my husband, but he's not good to me. So the enemy works overtime to get us to have a distorted view of God. And if he doesn't successfully distort it, he says, okay, God is good, but not for you. That's why you're having this trouble. That's why you're having this difficulty. And that's why I have to say what I say about every three weeks here. There's nothing you can do that will make him love you more. And there's nothing you can do that will cause him to love you less. God's love for you is perfect. Don't let the enemy distort the heart of God. The second thing, he wants to develop doubt concerning the word of God. And we look around the world, the virus of doubt. I tell you, uh, uh, the coronavirus isn't the only virus spreading around the world. 
There's a virus of doubt concerning God's word that's not only afflicted the mind of unbelievers, but it's also working its way into the heart of the church. Doubt and unbelief has now put on the professor's robe and, and the most popular speakers in many churches Christian colleges and seminaries are those who have made very clever arguments against the infallible, authoritative, and verbal inspiration of Scripture. They change definitions so that heresy sounds spiritual, logical, and scholarly, but changing the name of something doesn't change the reality. Going back to old Abe, I don't know why I've got Abe on my mind so much today, but I remember one time he was trying to make a point and he said, how many legs does a dog have if you call his tail a leg? And everybody said five. He says, no, he still has four because calling something another thing doesn't make it another thing. And loved ones, we are in a society today that is with all of its strength trying to change the reality of God's word, but changing it doesn't change it. And changing our view doesn't change what it really, as, uh, it really is. So mystery gives way to myth, revelation gives way to education, and he wants us to doubt the certainty of God's word. He wants you to see God as a liar who cannot be trusted. He wants you to doubt the reasonableness of God's word. He wants you to see God as an ogre who cannot love or be loved. Okay? So he's working on me doubting the word of God. He's working on defiling my concept of God. The third thing he does is he wants to distort the motives of God. Okay, he says, God's all-powerful and God's in control but God, he, he's really very selfish. See, the, the serpent said to Eve, it's not that your eyes will be open, at least not the way God explained. He said he wanted to protect you from evil. But you know what it is? He doesn't want your eyes open because he knows the minute you get this hidden knowledge, you will become just like him. Understand, Eve, God's not trying to take care of you. He just doesn't want you to move in and spoil his party. He wants us to doubt the motives of God. And the last thing is he wants us to deny the concept of God's justice. He wants us, if we believe God is who he said he is, if his, if his, if his love is right, if his mercy is there, he wants us to be eager to do away with God's um, sense of justice, the reality of punishment in this life or the next. You shall not surely die, the serpent said. Oh, rebelling against God has its consequences, but God is a softy at heart. And we have seen a whole doctrine flourish in the past century that's steadily growing and increasing. God loves us so much that he's going to save everybody in the end. Nobody will be lost. Even the devil will get a little mercy in the end. It's called universalism. It says everybody's going to be right. Jesus didn't die in vain, so everybody will be saved. There's no such thing as hell. And people buy into this because a lot of people are willing to say, well, I'll do wrong as long as I know my punishment isn't coming. Everything hell orchestrates seems to be designed to give us a flawed understanding of God. Now, I know we've got to, we've got to wrap this up. Although I don't mind going over a little bit today. I mean, where are you going, you know? But we've talked about Satan's deceit. And loved ones, he will work overtime in difficult times like this when we don't understand what's going on around us. Don't fall prey to his distortion and his deceit about the things of God. Well, you say, you're just telling me to watch out. Well, I also want to tell you that he loses and that we win, and that God wins. So there's one more passage I want to read. It's Revelation 12. And Revelation 12, in my opinion, um, uh, and not everybody believes this, just me and Jesus do, I know. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, Revelation 12. No, I'm not kidding. Revelation 12 is not a prophetic prediction. I don't think in the future there's going to be an event in Revelation 12 
uh, uh, that, uh, Revelation 12. I think Revelation 12 is a summary statement between the first part of Revelation and the second part of Revelation. And what John saw in Revelation 12 was the summary of the battle of the ages. It was to tell the people in his day, this is why you're suffering. This is why it sometimes looks like the devil wins instead of God. Because there's a battle going on that if you don't understand this battle, you'll be confused about everything taking place in the world. And if you don't understand the outcome of this battle, it'll cause despair. But he says, I want you to have faith. And this is what he writes in Revelation 12. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. This is what's going on and has been going on for eons. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. And this is how we win. This is how they won in the days of Jeremiah. This is how they won in the days of Jesus. This is how they won in the days of the book of Acts. This is how they won in the days of darkness in the Middle Ages. This is how they won in the Reformation. And this is how we win today. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Let me give you the key to victory over all the devices, all the methods, all the schemes of the devil. Number one, it's by the blood of the lamb. That means God has provided through his sacrifice all of the grace and sustaining power of God that we need. Grace has been called unmerited favor, and that's true. That's true. It is unmerited favor. But grace is so much more than that. Grace has two major components. Number one, it's God's good will toward us. That's unmerited favor. Grace says you'll never be good enough to come to my presence, but I extend grace to you. I extend a new robe to you. I extend a new standing, and you are made to be accessible to me. It's my good will toward you. But it doesn't even stop there. Grace is also defined as God's good work in us. Not just his good will toward us, but his good work in us. Everything we do, we do by the grace of God. Every victory we win, we win by the grace of God. Every trial we go through, we go through by the grace of God. Now, I not only win by the blood of the Lamb, okay, I win by the word of my testimony. That implies two things. It implies the words that I speak, and it, entire, it implies the integrity of my life. My testimony is not just what I say. My testimony is a life that backs up what I say. So here I am. He says, you want to know how to defeat the devil? Number one, it's all up to God to give you his grace and strength. We are as weak as water away from the Lord. Number one. Number two, I affirm, I say the right things and then my life backs it up. I say I'm a follower of Jesus and then I follow Jesus. That's why John would write to his disciples in Ephesus. He would say this in his, one of his epistles. He says, he that saith I abide in him ought also himself so to dwell as he dwelt. In other words, he says, if you say you're a Christian, live the way Christ died. And the final thing, it's by pleasing the Lord at all costs. It's, it's wordy in English. It says they, they overcame the enemy by not loving their lives unto death. And one way of translating that is simply they were willing to die for what they believed. It, it, it really carries this idea by pleasing the Lord at all costs. 
by serving the Lord even to the point of martyrdom. And you say, boy, that'd be tough to die for the Lord. But I'll tell you what's more important than dying for the Lord is living for the Lord and letting that truth bear out. Now, here's the summary. By the grace of God, I embrace a new way of living. By the power of the Spirit, I make up my mind to please the Lord at all costs. Loved ones, I know that this may go on longer than we think. I'm hoping in a couple of weeks we're back and everything's wonderful. But I want to tell you, if this thing goes longer and we have to meet like this for week after week after week until it gets squared away, I want to give you a guarantee. I want to give you a promise. The hand of Almighty God will hold you, will sustain you, will equip you, will cover you. And I tell you that he will never leave us, never forsake us. We are going to win this thing. We are going to win this thing because we're not ignorant of his devices. And when you get fearful, when lies begin to permeate, understand this is the, this is the lie of the enemy. This is what we've been taught. This is what we already know. We're not ignorant of his devices. And I know how to whip him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by living life in a way that it pleases the Lord at all times. Well, we are out of time, but you're used to that. I do want to pray with you before we close out the service, and there'll be uh, an announcement after I'm through preaching to give you some further direction. Father, in the strong name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone that's listening with us today. Some are listening right now. Some will be watching this later. But, Father, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to come to everyone where they are. We ask you now, come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Move into every office. Move into every bedroom. Move into every home. Every place that this service is, is being live streamed or watched at a later date, Holy Spirit, attend to the needs of your people. And we're so thankful that the eternal God is our refuge and underneath us are the everlasting arms. If you're listening with us today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to contact the church and we'd be glad to talk with you. But it's a very simple process to receive eternal life. It's not simplistic and it's not cheap, but he made it very simple. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He put it this way. He said, if I will acknowledge my sins to him and I will ask him for mercy, ask Jesus to come into my life in a spiritual way, become the forgiver of my sins, he said, I can begin to walk in eternal life and I'll never be the same. Contact us if you want more information about that. I love you. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you.